Well, you see, the word responsible, it's, it's in the word, you know, response, able, you have to be able to respond, part of, part of what all responsibility is. Well, but it's the nature of the procession, if you, if you proceed from the source that is a father, then you must be a son and an only son, it's the nature of a procession. Have you ever heard the word procession? Have you paid heed to the prefix pro in the word procession? This is gonna, this is gonna be stuff like that, like it's, But this is to go even further! And <laughs> My vital All right, so welcome everybody, and hello to anybody who's watching. This is sort of a follow-up video to the last discussion we had on uh, divine sovereignty versus uh, human free will. And so we will just kind of jump into things right here. I think it would be uh, great to just point out first off that this is not an essential issue. Did get to say that last time, but uh, with recent events going on, especially in light of um, Johnny KJZ, it's just I think very healthy to point out that this is not a salvation issue. Um, many Christian brothers. Uh, on on different sides of this issue line up when it comes to the divinity of Christ, the Trinity, um, and and other things, right? Things things communicated by say the Nicene Creed uh, and other various confessions. So I just think it's worth pointing out again that this is not uh, this does not define you as a Christian, uh, but it is a matter of uh, giving God glory and uh, having good doctrine. So. Any, any comments anyone would like to make on uh, that point, maybe? Yeah, I'd second that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Cool. Okay, with that being said, um, it might be useful to define our position. So last time we got to talk a little bit about um, Aaron uh, and Beetleman are um, idealistic monists and I believe you guys uh, take a libertarian freedom position. Uh, Max communicated that he is a Frankfurtian compatibilist. Uh, for the record I would I would hold to a compatibilist or concurrentist view. I believe that me and Charlie are in a traditional Calvinistic camp. So that's, uh, is, is that, am I uh, accurate there, Charlie? Yeah, yeah, that's accurate. Cool, cool. So let's maybe just go down the line and sort of give what we believe, what we take to be um, the idea of divine sovereignty and human freedom that we hold to. That way that when we get into this discussion and we make, we're making our arguments, um, there won't be straw manning going on. The last time, and I'll, and I'll jump the gun here and ask a question because uh, there was sort of a conversation going on last time but we had to cut it short. Uh, so I will ask Aaron and Beetleman, whoever wants to go first, uh, when we were discussing last time about metaphysics, it had come up that both of your views um, could think of the world as per an analogy of a grand MMORPG or, or a grand um, simulation uh, sim uh, sim similar to the Matrix for example where everyone is sort of plugged in or uh, uh, has their minds uh, connected to this simulation uh, God is running the simulator, as it were. The, the events that are going on take place in his mind. He controls uh, and decides whether or not things are going to happen within the simulation. But what he does not have control over, what he does not uh, determine, are the choices of the minds connected to that simulator. He can decide whether or not he wants to 
accept the choices of the minds that are connected to that simulator, the minds that he's created, but he does not choose what they choose. He does not determine uh, what choices they wish to do within that simulation. I think that's pretty fair. Yeah, I, I would say that that's fair. With one small little addition, I would say for my my own personal opinion, um, he doesn't have direct control necessarily, but he could if he wanted to, and he may in right. some instances. But there is no necessary connection between that. He doesn't always or have to have control. Neither does he never have direct control, nor could never have direct control. But that's all I'd add. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so God, God has the power to, to step in and control human freedom, but he doesn't necessarily do it. He doesn't do it all the time. Uh, human choices act on their own. Uh, to quote Cody, who is not here, the buck sort of stops with the decision maker. Right. In regards to a personal agent's choices, if they're truly libertarian, uh, I'll go with that, yeah. Okay, cool. Can I Excellent. ask him? Oh, I was just going to ask a, a clarifying question. I, I think maybe I asked this already last time, um, but maybe in case people didn't get to the other video, uh, if you guys, um, Beetle and Aaron, could give a just a really concise uh, explanation of what you guys mean by libertarian, um, and and the maybe the length and depth of the freedom which you guys are talking about. Oh, so my um, oh, there's Cody. Um, so my view on libertarianism is very uh, minimalist, and so all that is necessarily. All that needs to be there is the ability to have chosen otherwise, or or some um, non-determined sort of the the chain of cause chain of causation from one um, one's decision making process to that choice being made um, needs to begin with the agent and then. Um, whether or not that choice is assented to, because that's why it's concurrentist, um, that is what will be. That's what determine. That's what would determine whether or not the event actually takes place. But the choice itself um, rests in the agent's uh, decision-making process. So the causal chain starts with the agent, and it's possible that you could have chosen otherwise. Well, thanks, Beetle. You want to jump in? Yeah. Um, could you could you say your question again one more time so I'm, I just make sure I get it right? So so I'm just asking um, just for a concise explanation of what you guys mean when you are when you say uh, libertarian free will, um, and because we're we're obviously going to be getting into uh, its relationship to say like God's decree, and we've already started throwing around phrases like um, um, you know God. Uh, isn't directly in, necessarily in control of human choices and these sorts of things. So I'm just asking for a, yeah, just a brief description before we get underway uh, so we can all know the positions of you guys and for anybody watching of what you mean uh, by your libertarian uh, free will or the free choice and, and its relationship to God and, you know. So. Yeah. Um, I, I would agree with Aaron, I think, probably completely. I, I take a, a very minimalistic view on... Uh, libertarian free will. Um, I think that all that is necessary for a libertarian action or choice to happen is um, for for the state of affairs to be such that the you cannot account for the agent's choice causally by solely referring to causes outside of the agent that we're talking about. That's what I would say is, is all that's necessary for my form of libertarian freedom, that you can't, 
you can't say here is cause one through X or whatever. And these, when all put together in this way, 100% account for Agent Beetleman's or Agent Aaron's or whatever's choice. So completely independent, free from influence, is, is that kind of what you're saying? No, not free from influence, free from total causality. There has to be at least some aspect of the agent that can that's choice cannot be accounted for merely by the preceding causes outside of the agent. Could I could I ask a question about that? Yeah. Uh, so can preceding causes within the ontology of the agent uh, account for the choice made? What do you mean within the agent? Like their de deliberation process? Sure, so their, their deliberation process, their psychology, their neurology, their uh, biology, their, uh, their spirit you know, the, the heart of the man, things like this. Uh, as long as it's not 100% accounted for, I'd say. Okay, so... so I, guess it, I guess it depends on what you mean by the, by the, the agent. Well, so, like, if we're... Let's, let's use an example, right? If, um, if Maximus is walking down the street and sees a coffee shop, right? My understanding of your view of libertarian freedom is that given all of the facts, any, any fact that I could list about the universe in the moment in time uh, just preceding the choice, right? I have uh, no way to guarantee or to show that there is a causal entailment of the choice to walk in the coffee shop or not walk in the coffee shop based on all of those facts that I have there. I, I would say that uh, I would be against any attempt, well not necessarily against, I would, I would disagree with any attempt to deconstruct the agent to a set of preceding causes. If that happens, if we can't accept the agent as like my will, my choice cannot, if that is not uh, accepted as being a myriological simple, that is a, a core component that can't be reduced, then, then that's where I go, okay, I disagree and you're going to have to show me reasons to think that that's not the case. Okay, and I, I think that that gets into your, your metaphysic, but... Uh, Okay, without being polemic, right? Without having art, without using language that already argues for your point of view, isn't it isn't it uh, something that we can agree on that your point of view would say, given given all all the prior factors behind a choice, right? If I say, oh, Johnny chose uh, to eat sherbet ice cream because he likes sherbet ice cream, right? Or um, Johnny chose to uh, pay his bills today because if he doesn't pay them today, he'll get in trouble, right? If I list these motives and reasons, even if I could list all of the facts prior to the choice, it would not entail the choice, right? That's, that's the key thing about libertarianism is um, the agent in the choice event is completely free to exercise uh, uh, to do the thing in question or to not do the thing in question uh, without being caused or entailed to do so by prior facts. Yeah, I would agree. So I, I could say that given, given uh, a set of circumstances in which you could say uh, Jimmy chose chocolate ice cream because that's his favorite kind of ice cream or that was the only kind available or whatever. Um, given that scenario, there's no guarantee that knowing everything about your psychology and your desires and your everything like that and given everything about the circumstances you find yourself in in that state of affairs, that's still not enough to guarantee the action of you choosing 
the the chocolate ice cream Un under my view okay uh, Charlie does that does that help answer the the question yeah yeah I just wanted to again just have the dudes lay out kind of like their fundamental views uh, with, of what they mean just in case anybody jumps in at any time or goes back to listen to it so um, yeah thanks man and uh, Cody if I think if I recall, you're kind of in the same camp. If you want to uh, jump in on that too, if you didn't hear the question, let me know and I'll restate it. No, I I, I heard it enough. There's not, I guess there's not really much I can add to that. So. Yeah. yeah in my, on my view, the um, something like a, a reason or a preference or um, some kind of inclination to do something, like for example. Um, favoring chocolate over vanilla ice cream or something like that. These things serve, uh, they have a use in the ex in, in explaining uh, a, a, an action that is undertaken from an agent. But they're not um, to be mistaken for causes of an agent's action. The causation uh, stems straight from the agent and only from the agent. So it's it may be useful to talk about external things, which I would consider that kind of thing internal uh, to the agent's deliberation process. But um, but all these things are within the the process of an agent's causation, and not things that would um, determine or cause an action. The causation starts straight from the agent, and that's you know. So it all, it's only useful in, in explaining it, but not you know causing it. No, I right. agree with that. Okay, uh, so uh, welcome, Kara. I know that last time uh, your mic wasn't working so well, but feel free to join in if you got a mic that works. Meanwhile, uh, Max, would you like to share your perspective? Oh, okay. I know, sure. I know that you take a, uh, a more um, nuanced view to compatibilism. Right. So my own viewpoint on compatibilism is um, usually grounded in two things. The work on free will done by the Princeton professor Henry Frankfurt and, of course, on an interesting mix of Thomistic uh, metaphysics. Uh, so in terms of Thomistic metaphysics, um, I am not an ideal monist like uh, my friends Aaron and Beetle. Uh, my own view is that human beings participate in, with God in existence, and by that I mean it's kind of akin to uh, Platonism. The old philosopher Plato believed that something's essence or form was eternal and in the heavens, and that things in the material world uh, got their form and their appearance by how close they approximate to a specific form in the eternal heavens. And when it and let's say when a dog uh, participates with the essence of a dog as opposed to let's say a cat participating with the essence of a cat, they get their unique form, and that's how they participate in existence. However, with monotheism, what you do is you kind of scrunch together those platonic forms, put them in the eternal mind of God, and God is the being which everything in reality participates with for its existence. Um, under Thomism, uh, human beings have their form ingrained within their being, so they take a little more after Aristotle, but they believe that it corresponds to an essence in the eternal mind of God. And by uh, this form of participationism, we kind of get our existence. Now, humans are a type of human being who are, by essence, social, rational, and spiritual animals. This is what we are by essence. And how well we approximate that um, ideal is kind of the mark about how well we exemplify this. Um, somebody, who, somebody who makes their decisions in a way of what human beings are can be considered free because the way in which human beings make their decisions is in light of this essence. Uh, when a dog, um, if you have two bowls in front of you, when a dog walks up to one and starts eating, 
they, we can't say that that dog is doing it free because that dog is just acting upon instinct. It's not rationally deliberating. Um, human beings, on the other hand, can take into account their diets, their uh, which one they might prefer more in terms of taste. Um, they can deliberate on these two options to make a choice. Even though they don't have the capacity to do otherwise, I don't think it's necessary for free will, um, because they ultimately do it through this uh, process, um, this is kind of the mark about what makes their decision free. While God is, some, uh, and this is where God's sovereignty comes in, while ultimately all things come from God, including our choices, um, the very way in which God determines that choice through human nature is not is not of a deterministic variety like with the dog who acts upon instinct. God, when God decrees a certain option to come to fruition and man acts in accord with that, uh, what's happening there, as far as I believe it, is God God uh, moves mankind's free will in, in that scenario. And mankind, uh, using those faculties, partakes within um, the food he rationally chooses. And when that uh, state of affairs is actualized, that man can be said to be doing that of his own free will. So that's generally how um, I merge all these together. Cool, okay. Um, so let's, let me jump back. I, I have all the pictures getting mixed up. So Charlie, maybe, maybe we can distinguish our view now. I know uh, Truth Spiller, I think you're, I'm pretty sure that you are um, in the Reformed camp, are you not? Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool, okay. All right, so I will uh, let Charlie go, and then if maybe you or me have any distinctions to make, uh, I'll give us the floor then. Go ahead, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, um, so I also am of the Reform camp and hold to a compatibilist view of God's sovereignty and man's will. Um, I definitely uh, would say that uh, I work from, you know, a view that I get from Ephesians 1.11, um, where it talks about, um, you know, in, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, um, or, or like we read in, in Daniel 4, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar, you know, says all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to the will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? So I think um, it's, my, it's my position that in order to understand um, either the, the limitations or, or non-limitations that we have um, for our will, we need to understand uh, God's, you know, uh, who he is, what he has spoken about himself, um, and, and uh, what his power is. And, and so uh, it's my position that uh, God is um, uh, the sovereign one. He is the only uh, libertarian free being um, that exists, and he has uh, a decree. He has uh, two decrees, a secret decree and uh, his uh, prescriptive decree. And it is his secret decree that um, brings all of history about, brings about our reality. Uh, we don't know it. Uh, he knows it. He has the holy warrants to, to keep it hidden from us uh, because he is the potter and, and we are the clay. Um, but in regards to man's will, um, I also, you know, hold to uh, those verses that we read where it talks about man being a slave to sin, um, that our will is, is bound up in the condition of our hearts, that we do freely choose, but the choosing is dependent upon whether our heart has been regenerated or not. And so if it, if it hasn't been, we will freely choose um, everything uh, that we do so will be against God, will be for ourselves, it will not be pleasing to God, uh, because you know Paul talks about those who are in the flesh, um, their minds are hostile to God, they cannot submit to him, uh, so we can't do anything pleasing to God when we are in the flesh, um, but God alone has the ability to bring us out of that uh, by his spirit, placing us in Christ, and liberating our will in, in a sense, not that it's, it's free outside of his decree again, 
but that we've we simply have had a change of masters. No longer is sin our slave master, but Jesus is. And so therefore now we can freely choose uh, things like obedience and things that are pleasing to God. And they don't merit, merit us anything salvifically, but, um, but they are a part of the sanctification, the part of our, our image being uh, conformed to the image of Christ. Um, yeah, so that's my view. I don't, I don't know if I, uh, if I uh, left anything out, if anybody wants to jump in or not. No, that's really uh, good. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Max. Oh, actually, I was just going to ask a question about that. Um, under your so under your viewpoint, would you say that your um, would you say your ideas about free will are more informed by um, scriptural passages as opposed to any specific uh, model of metaphysics? Yeah, so I would say that um, I, I I adhere to the five solas, and so obviously uh, sola scriptura, that the scriptures alone are our infallible rule of faith and practice. They are theanostas, they are God-breathed, they are what God has preserved for us um, for all areas of life, uh, specifically knowing him in as much as he allows us to, and knowing what we need to know in regards to uh, salvation, um, holy, godly living, and... Um, the promises that, that, that Christ uh, will keep uh, his uh, mediatorial role and that such. So, yes, yeah, Scripture is, for me, um, my highest authority. It is, it is what I use. It is my lens. Um, yes. Short answer, yes. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks. Uh, Truth Speller, did you want to add anything about... I think... Uh, Charlie, you just basically gave a, an overview of the Ephesians. <laughs> you basically gave a, an overview of uh, Ephesians 1 and 2 there, it sounded like to me. Did you want to add anything to that, uh, Truth Speller? To the... and, and not to jump in really qu I just want to jump in Truth Speller just really quick, and I'll, I'll let you take it. Um, and that's, I was talking to Jimmy before, before uh, this, and that's kind of what I wanted to maybe offer up to everyone here, is, is not just... Uh, us just um, maybe just running rampant with our discussions, but um, giving scriptural foundations. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if everybody here would adhere to the same um, position that I just put forward, that scripture is our highest authority and that sort of thing. Some people do, some people don't. Um, but I definitely think that it's still important to, to defend from scripture um, our positions. Uh, and so, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Anyways. Yeah, for for myself, I put uh, scripture on par with church with uh, church tradition, but that's from my background as a Catholic. So I think, um, but at the end of the day, I have to adhere to scripture as well as well as what tradition I teaches about said scripture. So at the end of the day, my model has to conform with orthodoxy, lest it be rubbish. So you're you would adhere to this the the six sola sola ecclesia. Solo Ecclesia, exactly. Yeah, the church alone. Okay. Thanks, man. Yeah, no worries. Cool, okay. Uh, so, uh, I, I was going to let you go first, Truth Speller, because I know I, I wanted to make a comment, but uh, did you want to say anything? Yeah, uh, I, just my two cents. It's hard to follow Char Charlie and Max because they really did a good job. Um, I think I agree pretty much with both of them. <clears throat> I, uh, scripture is my main source for understanding predestination. But it is funny how logically or um, philosophically those, those uh, understandings seem to line up when you think about them. If uh, outcome is determined by effects of design, then ultimately the designer seems like he would be responsible for the outcome. Um, and he created things in such a way that you know, everything is has its own weakness and strengths and, and abilities. Uh, everything in nature, um, everything with people, that he could have tweaked anything to any billions of different combinations in the way they are, but he allowed them to be made the way things are. And I believe that's, you know, for a purpose, ultimately, that he's planned. And, <clears throat> yeah, my main thing is 
about predestination is just it's just taught from the very beginning of the Bible it seems to the very end of it and it just seems to be undeniable it's the one only reason I believe in it is God has given me the faith you know to believe in him and, and his word and and I use that to sort of renew my mind from what I would naturally think which is human free will uh, when I first became a believer that's what I believed and if you ask most people that don't even believe that's what they believe so I guess that would probably sum up my position. <laughs> but great words, guys. Good listening to you. Cool, cool. All right. So, I, yeah, I guess uh, I will just uh, – short preamble to my, to my comment. Yeah, I guess I will point out that in this video it's uh, hoped that we can come up with some kind of uh, – biblical constructing of these positions, that they're not just uh, sitting out there floating on air, but that um, there's actually a reason for a Christian uh, believer to think that these things are true according to the revelation in God's word. Um, I guess the, the comment that I was going to make is uh, with respect to human, human freedom and, and divine sovereignty, just to give you kind of uh, definitions. I'll use uh, a passage here. It's from Proverbs 21.1. It reads, um, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. All right. And so the, the idea of, the Calvinist idea of human freedom, uh, I think is best uh, communicated by Jonathan Edwards, and I think you can find it throughout Scripture, and it is that uh, humans are free insofar as uh, they do what they desire. Whatever is in the heart of a man to do, uh, that's what he will do. That's what he will choose. Um, but it is God who gives a person his heart. And so as Charlie was saying, we're all born into this world uh, sinful, disobedient, um, children of Adam, right? And the the issue of freedom is really not to be free. At least I would argue, according to Scripture, is the the freedom that is key is not the ability to do otherwise, but rather the ability to do good. And so the freedom that you get talked about, especially in the New Testament and in books like um, the the uh, redemption story in Exodus is this freedom from a slavery to um, an evil god, right, to, to the uh, prince of the powers of the air, as it is put in Paul's epistles. Anyways, uh, I, so I, I think that on the one hand, uh, God sovereignly decrees everything that occurs. I'm a classic Calvinist. Nothing, nothing uh, comes to pass unless God first ordains it. Um, at the same time, human beings are free, and that doesn't mean that they have the ability to do otherwise. It simply means they have the ability to accomplish their heart's greatest desire. And since our desires are um, inherently evil without Jesus, we need uh, Jesus to free us from our evil desires. Um, we will always be doing wrong until uh, he is our Savior. Any uh, any questions or comments on that? If if not, I want to move on to Cody. All right, cool. So, Cody, I think you've uh, had to tell us this a couple times now, but maybe you can give us a quick rundown of the Molinist position again, especially because. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Especially because what? Oh, especially because um, Molinism, correct me if I'm wrong, but Molinism is more unique for its perspective on how libertarian freedom relates to divine sovereignty rather than libertarianism itself. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, okay, so on Molinism, right, you've got uh, – it distinguishes between three modes of God's knowledge, right, natural, free knowledge, and then middle knowledge, which is – in the middle of all that, hence the name, middle knowledge. Um, natural knowledge being basically all logically necessary truths, right? And then uh, that are, you know, yeah. And then you got uh, 
free knowledge, which is the free knowledge is the result of God's uh, divine creative decree or his decision, I guess, to create the world. Then in the middle of that, you have middle knowledge, which is are certain contingent truths that would which would mostly comprise of things like counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. So, yeah, basically any counterfactual statement about a libertarian free creature. And so God, with his middle knowledge, since he knows this prior logically prior to his divine creative decree, uh, basically orders the world around his middle not with it, using his middle knowledge, right? So a way example of how this could work, right, is take the story in Genesis 50, right, of Joseph's brothers being sold. I mean, Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers, right, and then he ends up, you know, doing all this good stuff in the end, and then you know he says to his brothers, like, you know, fear not, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So a, Mol a Molinist answer, a Molinist perspective on this would basically say that. Uh, God basically, okay, so he placed Joseph and placed his brothers in that situation knowing that they would freely sell Joseph into slavery and that, you know, all this subsequent stuff would eventually happen. And so it happens all because of God's sovereign creative decree, right? But nevertheless, everyone involved was still free in a libertarian sense. So that's in this way, right? I think we it, we can offer a coherent account of how we could reconcile divine sovereignty with human free will. So that's a that's a short answer to the question. Cool, awesome. Yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the scriptural example. That that gives us uh, one of the places we can go to when we start arguing about these things. So so before we now that. I think we've all sort of established like what we believe about uh, human freedom, you know, how the mechanism works, and where God's coming from, and uh, what the issues are. Um, I would just like to point out again that uh, the the goal here is to have a point of view that is consistent with what God teaches in Scripture and. Uh, not otherwise. If we, I think we agreed in the last video that if the thing in question doesn't comport to what the scripture teaches, if it's inconsistent with God's revelation in the Bible, um, then it can be thrown out from the outset. There's no reason to speculate about whether or not it's true, because there is no set thing as uh, truth uh, which disagrees with the opinion of God as revealed in his scripture. So um, at this point, I guess I'll just open it up. If anyone wants to start maybe making a biblical defense or, or giving us some sort of um, exegetical route to take their approach. I'd, I'd like to say something for my own sake before we start. Uh, I hope that I want to make sure that nobody here mistakes my passion for hostility. <laughs> uh, last time I was on the chat, I know I got kind of uh, intense. Uh, I don't know if anybody else perceived that. I don't. I don't. I'm not angry at you guys, and this doesn't make me angry. But if I get like sounding like I'm really intense, it's because I really enjoy talking about this. I'm attacking the argument and the position, not the person. Just wanted to cover my bases there before we started. So pretty much uh, leave mamas out of it then, right? Preferably, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. I think we can all agree to that. Um, so could I perhaps start with my own biblical defense of my position? A at least one that sides more, I believe, to the compatible side than does the libertarian side. Oh, yes. I, my, my Augustinian roots... Uh, determined me to favor you. Go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. All right. In St. Anselm's dialogues, he he has a student ask him um, on the fall of the angels uh, about 1 Corinthians, which, which is kind of interesting. He says, For what does man have that God has not given him? I don't know the specific verse offhand, but it seems like a pretty interesting one. Now, if that is the case, we have nothing to which God has not given us. Does not our salvation also fall from that as being that one thing? I mean, grant, salvation is given to us by grace. Yes, I think even Arminians would say that there is um, a prevenient grace that enables us to either choose or not choose um, to accept Christ uh, for the sake of salvation. But 
ultimately there's going to be some kind of difference between why somebody decides to choose salvation and why someone doesn't. It seems that ultimately it will reduce to uh, God granting it. And if that is the case, if one cannot do what otherwise God grants to you because no one receives anything but what they get from God, then wouldn't, that, wouldn't a kind of compatibilism follow there? Responses from any of the libertarians? That might follow uh, on the issue of salvation, um, like a, a compatibilism on on uh, soteriology, but I don't think that it necessarily might follow for every single action a human does. Okay. I, would al I would also say real quick uh, that what was the word that you used? You said uh, that granted, that God grants... Uh, I would say that grant, it only follows in compatibilism if grant means cause, or maybe it only refutes libertarianism if grant means cause, which doesn't seem immediately obvious to me. Well, right, I mean, yeah, so... Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, no, no, go ahead, Aaron. No. Okay. Um, so, what... It, the the first point was what does man have that is not granted to him by God? If God has created agents, then there is nothing that that actually takes place that isn't actuated by God. No state of affairs comes to be that isn't you know assented to by Him. But I wouldn't say that um, that necessarily makes him lack his agent causal powers because. If God has created agents, then nothing is given to the agent that's not granted to him. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, he doesn't freely choose between uh, some some alternatives. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I also would make a point that it 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 seems trivially obvious that uh, causes can be looked to as reasons. That seems obvious. So if we see a boulder that rolls down a mountain and smashes somebody's shack, we can say, oh, the reason that that shack was smashed just now was because that boulder caused it to splinter into pieces when it fell on it. But it doesn't seem that the vice versa is obviously true, that reasons entail causes. So I just wanted to point that out. I wasn't making a specific critique necessarily, but I think that'll come into play pretty soon. That it, I would like to see. I would like to see why reasons entail causes, because it's it's obvious that causes entail reasons, but I don't see how it's obvious that the opposite is true. I think let me let me jump in real quick. So Max, could you could you uh, clarify your argument? Because I think I think that I understood it, but I'm not sure that. I'm not sure it was clear the the sort of uh, the the sword point to that argument. Right. I really wish I had Anselm's dialogues on hand because the verse is, in because it would be nice to actually have a far more accurate portrayal of the verse. So I, so I would actually say that this is causally given as well as given by reason, because Anselm is, or the writer is specifically uh, speaking about things people have or are given to them versus things which they don't have and aren't given to them. To give something, I think, would imply some kind of causal relationship because at event one, the agent does not have something, yet at event two, the agent does seem to possess something. So it does seem to be um, something which is not, not only about reasons but is also given. So if um, we go with anything from... Um, the agent's choices to the uh, to the specific deliberation they'll have anything which entails that they choose A over B would that not in um, it seems to ultimately come from God Himself and if event one doesn't happen then by the logic of the writer event two would not have happened. Okay, so let me. This is 1 Corinthians 4.7. Is it okay if I read uh, a little bit around the passage to give us some context? Yeah, please go right ahead. 
Oh, Charlie, did you want to say something? No, no, go ahead, man. Okay, I saw your I saw your mic jump on. Okay, let's see. Uh, so the chapter begins, not necessarily that that's a thought break, but chapter begins with, Let a man regard us in this ma manner, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you, or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment for the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come from him, will come to him from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast? as if you had not received it. You are already filled, you have already become rich, you have become kings without us, and indeed I wish you had become kings so that we also might reign with you. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all, as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong, you are distinguished, we are without honor. So, like, let, let me let me see if I understand this, right? So, Max, your argument seems to be that in verse seven, uh, where Paul says, uh, "What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it?" Um, the argument there is that. Uh, God's uh, choice to grant people what they have and everything that they have, everything that can be predicated of them is granted by God. That choice on God's part is not only preconditional um, to their having whatever it is that they have, but it's also sufficient. In other words, if God decides that you will have X, Y, Z, um, you need to refer to no other reason to know that you will have X, Y, Z, including whatever the person's choices are. Yeah, that pretty much nails the. Um, uh, that pretty much uh, hits where it needs to. Uh, I think you, you you summed it up perfectly. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, so, what do what would how would a libertarian? Uh, I mean, okay. Um, surely, surely there's <laughs> there's a response. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so from from what I gather from the passage, and I uh, I was reading it along in KJV, so you know, <laughs> just uh, excuse if any context I may have missed. Yeah. <laughs> so um. <laughs> so. From what I gather from the context of this, uh, in verse 8, he says, Now you are full, now you are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, uh, that we might also reign with you. Um, and so, what it seems to be there in his asking, you know, uh, what, what do you have uh, that you didn't receive? He's talking about accomplishments, uh, material wealth, um, so social status, and things like that. So, uh, for who maketh thee to differ from one another, what hast thou that uh, that thou didst not receive? Uh, now, if you did receive it, why do you boast? As if, you know, the things that, that end up occurring to us are not of ourselves, and I don't think any libertarian is saying that we choose to be uh, rich, or we choose to be smart, we choose to um, have accomplishments that that are solely derived from our own choices as agents, as if we have power over the way things end up in the world. And so, I don't think any libertarian would make any statement that would contradict 
what I see from the context of this passage. All right, but in terms of the context of the passage, if even one was to say that their own choices were uh, fully up to them, that they could have chosen otherwise, as opposed to granting what they have from God as opposed to uh, from themselves, then I think someone like Apollos could fully well respond by saying, well, Paul, I, a lot of these material things I did not have, but by my own choice I was able to maintain them and I was able to take care of the sheep. And yeah, like you could always provide reasons to be puffed up, even if they reduce down to simple choices one makes. Whereas if it was to be far more encompassing for everything that one has, including one's choice, then there would seem to be no, absolutely no room to boast. For, well, and, uh, yeah. uh, oh, go ahead. So Anselm says uh, on the specific passage after it's given, uh, by his student, no creature has anything from itself, for if a thing does not have itself from itself, how can it have anything from itself? In short, since there are only two sorts of things, the creator and the created, whatever being has anything must be either God's being or created being. And, and the student responds by saying that's clear, and the teacher, and Psalm responds by saying, but neither the creator nor what he has created can have be their being from any source other than God himself. So if, so if it is far more encompassing, as Anselm says, to all of that, it seems to mark the passage as being far more understandable. You have absolutely no room, but if one was to say their own choices, at least, came from themselves, then there would have to be something in existence that does not come from, uh, causally speaking, the, the Lord God, ultimately. Okay, uh, that's, that's actually a, that's a good uh, response. Um, I think that f for me, I'm I'm sitting here thinking that if I'm going to boast about something as if I've accomplished something, but I've but everything that I accomplish is through tools that were given to me. Uh, you know, if if I'm smart enough to be able to to understand a smart choice from an irresponsible choice or a foolish choice. Um, then I really haven't accomplished anything through myself. If I'm only taking advantage of opportunities that are put in front of me um, by virtue of the world that is actual, and I had no control over that whatsoever, my being born in these particular circumstances or things that have occurred to me, um, you know, I can be... Uh, I can be the, the best decision maker or deliberator uh, known to man, but that is not going to accomplish anything unless an opportunity is given to me and certain analytical tools are given to me um, as a human to take advantage of those things. So nothing that I have is actually of my own self. Everything is contingent on the way the world is and, and the circumstances I was born in. Okay, so but that, that would be my... Yeah. All right, but if they do reduce to the tools that are given, and these tools are ultimately given by God, then it would seem that the way in which things go about ultimately come from God. And earlier, even both you and Beetle, um, I think, agreed on the point that you can't really um, narrow things down to anything outside of the agent. But these specific tools, uh, portions of analytical thought, um, if they're all on an individual basis given by the Creator, and that's kind of what... Um, provides the outcome, um, and then doesn't that really require um, a negation of your position? At least a very important aspect of it. That's that's actually a great a great point. So like earlier, I think you brought up the the um the fact that the nature of a human being is such that you know the, well our choices <clears throat> are going to ultimately be formed based on the nature of what what our own selves are, or of the, our own nature. And so someone of a sinful nature is going to tend to make sinful choices. However, um, I don't see how having a certain nature is going to entail any particular or specific choice to be made. It only entails that a certain kind of tendency or a certain kind of choices will be uh, available to that agent. Um, that would otherwise not be available. And so it doesn't, um, 
it doesn't close and eliminate all the everything to one specific type of choice that could be made. Uh, it just limits a certain list of alternatives that will be available to that kind of agent. Aaron, would you agree that it, I, I, I actually am pleased to kind of hear where you're going with this um, in admitting that there's a limitation? I mean, if you acknowledge right. that that foundationally um, our let's, let's let's say our hearts and the condition of them are what give rise to say the desires that we choose to follow or not follow the condition of our hearts would be the limiting factor for um, for those choices and those set of options or possibilities before us would you agree so so like so, so like an unregenerate heart would only give rise to ungodly desires and i don't just mean like incredibly de depraved like you know, murdering, but just like all of your desires in their very root because your heart is unregenerate would be um, ungodly and unpleasing to God. Would you agree? Right, yeah. We only have available to us um, what is what is granted to us. Um, right, okay. Cool, I just wanted to clarify that. Mm. So... Per, uh, per Max's argument, though, it seems to me like the issue here uh, has to do with two things in the text. If I And correct me if I'm wrong about this or if you guys think there's more nuance to it or, or there's even more things that are disagreed about here in the text. But uh, I'll read verse 7 again. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So the, I think the key, the key thought there that uh, Max is picking up on and is just kind of relating that to a biblical worldview in general is just the idea, what do you have that you did not receive, right? Anything that you can point to um, was given to you by God. The key issue there, from my perspective, is uh, what is meant by everything and uh, whether or not the choice that God makes to give someone something is sufficient to establish that they have it, right? Is, is that a sufficient cause of that person's um, uh, having been or being bequeathed with whatever it is they're being given, right? From the perspective uh, of the text, it seems to me there's no question as to the latter, right? The, Paul doesn't say, um, what, uh, what do you have that you did not receive and accept? There's, there's no thought needing to be added there that they had to accept these things or that they had to grant God his own choice to, to give them these things. No, like God's choice is sufficient um, to establish some reality. So if God wants to give you something, it's not as if he fails uh, to give you what he wants to give you. But then the question I think that got brought up uh, when you were looking at the context, Aaron, is uh, what does um, what does the what does the everything concept here mean? Or is it even an everything concept, right? What do you have, right? What is Paul talking about there when he says, what do you have? In In my understanding uh, based on what he says in verse 8 it looks like um, uh, now in KJV it says now ye are full w what does it say in, in your translation in verse 8 sorry I, my mic messed up uh, in verse 8 it says yeah you are already filled you have become rich oh, I assume he means that you have food and in being filled, I don't, you know, there could be full of knowledge or full and fulfilled. <laughs> uh, but that first part, um, now you're rich, you have reigned as kings. And so I'm still thinking that people are boasting of their own social status and, um, and their accumulation of, of material wealth. And um, maybe they could even be boasting about uh, their own living their own lifestyles and the way that they live and thinking that they have accomplished something in living a holy life 
or that they have accomplished something in um, in in attaining some material wealth. And so Paul is saying, you don't have a single thing that wasn't given to you, so don't boast as if uh, you have attained something of your own selves. Now, the reason I don't I don't think that this undermines libertarian free will is because you can have libertarian free will and make these statements and nothing that you would be saying would be contradictory. Um, it doesn't go against libertarian free will to say you don't have anything that wasn't given to you. And so, you know, God is certainly sufficient to bring about anything that he wants to bring about. Um, and, you know, all of, all of everything that goes with that. However, um, none of this says that, um, that, each individual choice that you made could not have been otherwise in your attaining of that. If you take advantage of some opportunity that was given to you, you don't boast on your taking advantage of something that was laid at your feet. Um, you don't have anything that wasn't given to you as an opportunity. And but Mike is, uh, it's like a statement about standing on the shoulders of giants. This, this verse or this passage I think you can understand it. I would agree with Aaron in the way that it's it's very clear that it's a exhortation to be humble and to remember. You, I guess you could say remember your roots if you're trying to use like modern day lingo. Check your um, privilege. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you didn't just pop out of nowhere. You didn't just your wealth. You didn't just create it out of thin air. That that was stuff that you took from people, right, wrong, or otherwise. You took it from. People. You know, your your status as, you know, saved, your status as, you know, followers of Christ, your status as whatever, is it, it's not something that you just sat there and just, you know, summoned out of nothing. Well, I might, I might actually I think jump that in. That, I think you've got to be careful to whenever, whenever we start reading Scripture not to get a spiritual message or a, a, a message about how we are ought to relate to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, how we ought to relate to the church as a whole, how we ought to relate to Christ and to God. When we start to say, no, 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 let's go, let's go another direction and try to grab metaphysics out of Scripture, that's where we need to be extremely careful. I mean, we've got to be careful anyway, but I would say that this is sounding like we're trying, well, we, uh, some of us are trying to read metaphysics out of a passage that's simply not speaking to anything of the sort. All right. Um, actually, I'll, I'll speak to that because I was the one who brought this up. And it's kind of interesting because there's this uh, kind of topic is discussed a little um, in the introduction of the book where I'm reading Anselm's three dialogues. Anselm's actually saying um, that what you have that you did not receive is even to the angels, and that nothing is from God but be good and being, and that every good has being, and every being is good. So he's applying it to the angels. Now, we've read the context out loud. There is no reference to angels at all. Not once. And if you were to ask Anselm, why is he applying this to angelology when angels aren't even discussed, he'd probably say, well, it also doesn't really mention uh, rich white people in the suburbs in the 21st century. But it would apply there too. Uh, the point. Uh, the point is, if there is some kind of uh, proposition behind it, and you can, and we can extrapolate or draw metaphysical implications from the passage, then we might as well. I mean, uh, is not scripture profitable for good teaching? And I really don't see that much of a problem with um, Anselm's method here, nor our application in this conversation. As for the passage in question, uh, what do you have that you did not receive? I believe someone could respond to Paul by simply saying, "Well, my my abil well the uh, a chain of events that I have is something that is completely derived from me because it could have been otherwise or rendered otherwise by me." That seems to be, that could be a perfect response from a libertarian uh, to detract what Paul is saying. And I, and I think it is pretty fair to, um, to point this out. It does. There does seem to be an inconsistency there. 
No, I, I wouldn't as a liberal. I don't think anybody would say that in Paul's time because, well, they, I don't think they would. But even if I granted that, I would say that I, 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 w I wouldn't ever say that, oh, my, the chain of events of my choices is all completely derived from me in the sense that it has nothing to do with external influences. You know, uh, being a libertarian, at least in the sense that Aaron and I are libertarians, we are, uh, I think, very realistic about we can't just choose to sprout wings and then you know, fly away. We can't just choose to all of a sudden be, you know, extremely generous if we were, you know, always extremely miserly and very greedy and stuff. We can't just, you know, I'm going to just choose, oh, all of a sudden now I'm just super generous and I give up all my wealth and stuff. No, it's a process. Um... But we are saying that it's it's not just completely outside of us. I think you, I think the, the the again I think the, the the tip of this argument is being failed to be understood. The problem is not that libertarians don't give credit to God. The problem is that their position, if followed consistently, gives the reader an excuse to correct Paul. Because in the case of um, the operation of the free choices themselves, those could not be given by God because God's choice to give someone something is sufficient in and of itself. It would by itself stand as a cause. Right, so my, my personal response to that would be that it is not boastworthy um, to use analytical tools that were given to you to take opportunities that were laid at your feet um, that were made readily apparent to you by something external to yourself. Nothing that actually happens to you, nothing that you have is ever of yourself. Nothing that, I mean, if, if God hadn't given this opportunity to you, there is nothing in free will that just allows you to have anything at all unless that, that opportunity is presented to you and then you choose from any list of opportunities and even your nature in your own personal nature your personality um, that can have a you know can be uh, in a sense determined by God but your choices if God has created agents um, then there's no reason to think that it's boast worthy to, to attribute anything that you have to yourself because nothing that you have actually does come from yourself. Right, but I think that the, the distinction there that you have to make then, Aaron, is that God is giving mere opportunities. And that doesn't sound like what Paul is saying. Paul, Paul sounds like what he's uh, saying, given in the context, is that um, this person's social standing, this person's uh, uh, what did you say? <laughs> this person's privilege, right? Check your privilege. <laughs> uh, not not an opportunity for that, but rather this person's actual state. You know, the actual state of affairs. All the all the the things that this person actually has has been given to him. And and the key thing is, well, we usually think of of our choices uh, having an effect on. Uh, whether or not we're in some certain social circles or whether or not we are rich, right? The, the economist studies how to deliberate, how to make choices um, that are keen to uh, success, uh, monetal success, or, or you know, if he's in a bartering country, right, some, some other sort of success. But Paul does, I don't think, I'm not sure how the libertarian is going to argue that that's an opening here. The lib Paul seems to be arguing that no, even those choices you made, whatever whatever you have at all that that relates to the issue that I'm talking about, and I think uh, I think Max is correct by extension everything, but at least in this particular context, everything in that in that context where you have made choices, where you have quote unquote freely uh, made choices in, in economics and politics and uh, social standings, even those are given to you by God. Everything there is given to you by God. And the key thing there is, on libertarianism, if, if the person can choose to do otherwise, meaning they could, they could choose not to have the successes that they have, they could choose uh, not to be in the social standings that they have, then what you're essentially saying is it's possible for God to fail to give 
someone something that he chooses to give them. How no, that's, that's not. That's not. That's not that's I wouldn't say that. that. Now, <laughs> add something here. Well, I mean, what if? Well, maybe. What if we factored in middle knowledge into the equation, right? Because you know, if we factor middle knowledge in, right? God, you know, set up at every everything. No, you know, put those opportunities for you knowing that you would take them, right? So in that sense, right, God is still sovereign in giving you all these things, right? Because He has such control and such knowledge of everything that even your even in those cases where you freely made the choice, God only put the opportunities there in the first place because He knew you would freely make the choice that could have gotten you those specific things. So just want to throw that out there. Uh, but even if we were Oh, go ahead, Charlie. No, go ahead, go ahead, because I, I think my question will knock the house of cards over, so I'll wait. Oh, all right. Um, I mean, even factoring in middle knowledge, if God, uh, through the use of middle knowledge, foreknows what you will do, then by that extent, through his foreknowledge, that is what you ought to do. That is, that necessarily follows that you will do. So at that point... Would we have no ability to do otherwise? You know, remember now, middle knowledge is what is not just is not necessarily what you will do, but what you would do. Because remember, God logically knows all knows all these logically prior to His divine creative decree, right? So that, you know, He, I mean, yes, because you have liberty and free will, it's pos- You could have chosen to do otherwise. God just knew that you wouldn't choose otherwise. All right, I have a clarifying question for you, Cody. Um, sure. With using like speaking about middle knowledge. Mm-hmm. Where does the information come from concerning what you would do in all situations? So, what what is what what is what is the source from which God's middle knowledge is drawing on? Like, where where do the characteristics come from that make up me concerning my choices in you know situation A, B, and C, and God knowing all of those? Like, if God knows Charlie will choose B with these certain um, factors in these, you know, in the situation. Where is God getting my characteristic and what makes me me and the information? Where does that come from? You mean where does where does the truth claim of where, 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 where you mean where does the truth claim about a counterfactual free will come from? Where, where do counterfactuals of creaturely freedom where are they grounded? How is God informed about them? Where are they grounded? They're simply grounded in the fact of the counterfactual, right? So I, okay. but, but I'm, right, go ahead, Jimmy. You might be able to articulate that a little better. Right. So that's that's that. What you just said, Cody, is exactly what what Charlie's asking you. How does God? Uh, okay, but if uh, we're gonna know about that, what what is what, where is his uh, informant on that information? The whole question, though, assumes a per- has to assume some kind of particular view of truth maker theory, right? That needs to be articulated. Like, why think that counterfactuals have to have some thing out there that has to quote unquote ground them in the first place. So but like, we're talking about we're talking about God is withholding this knowledge in his head, right? And so he's the one that I guess that Aaron would say would assent assent to the choice that I make, right? Given given the opportunity or given the the circumstances that I get to choose one freely, but what I'm saying is, you know, yeah, where does the, where does the information come from that says Charlie will choose A instead of B and C in this situation. Uh, I'd also like to add, um, would you consider yourself, Cody, uh, a correspondence theorist? I mean, I could imagine you making a similar argument if you were perhaps a coherentist. Um, and a well, theistic coherentist. Oh. Well, uh, coherentism is viable, in my opinion, at least. Um, but uh, could you kind of outline your position there? Um, do you mean coherentism, like the epistemology of coherentism? Or? It's I'm, the notion. Yeah, it's the notion well, that uh, the, the correspondence theory of truth doesn't necessarily entail that you have to have some sort of truth maker out there for counterfactuals. That's something that's so, sort of added later by certain Australian philosophers, as, as William Lane Craig points out. But I just don't see anything in the correspondence theory of truth as such that requires there to be these objects or, or these things out there to ground counterfactuals in the way that you're. I, I get. I assume that you're asking. Right, maybe, maybe. May, let me flesh this out a little bit, Cody, and and Please. maybe this will kind of like. All right. So, so what I would ask is, 
Um, okay, uh, do, does God have a purpose in creation? What is God? What is God trying to accomplish in in choosing which world to actualize? Um, well, lots of things, I guess. Um, <laughs> what's 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 the what's the primary? I, I, I know a good chunk. I, I, <laughs> That's I, a I, tough question. Yeah, uh, I, I, I know a is part there, of that. I'm sure goal? a part of that is to you know salvation, save people, or something. I don't know. I mean, it is kind of a complicated question since there's there's a lot of stuff intentions I'm sure he has. Uh, okay. I just want to I want to insert really quick then. That that would probably be another area where we might be like fundamentally um, maybe just on not on different islands but maybe on different beaches, but we where we would probably affirm that that God's primary purpose in in creation is his glorification, is the glorification of himself. All things are, you know, through him, to him, for him. Um, and so, so um, yeah. The reason why I ask that though is because uh, I think that that might kind of help us understand if if you guys had something kind of similar to why God would create. Like, what is He doing in in actualizing these this world? What is His end goal? Um, because that might I don't know. That just might kind of help. Uh, us ask a better question in grounding, like where this information comes from. Is that he, because if he has a goal, like if he, so, if you guys were to say, like you know, God, if you took the same position that God is ultimately, um, he created in order to glorify himself, in order to make himself known, in order to reveal his attributes clearly in 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 whatever way that he freely chose to, um, then then there would be things that God would freely choose to do or decree or order that would bring about history in such a way that would make his characteristics meaningful, um, that would make the crucifixion meaningful, right? Um, I think we would all agree that the cross was decreed from before the creation, right? Right. Right, okay, so, so in order for the cross to have meaning in history, there are so many things that have to happen that, in order for that to mean something. Um, even before Israel in in Egypt, you know, like the fall, like the fall has to happen in order for there to be this need for God to enter into history in order to display himself in that way, to give the cross meaning. And so I guess why I'm asking that is, is asking you guys if, you know, if God has a purpose, um, what is he trying to accomplish in actualizing these worlds? Because because if he's trying to actualize one, if it's a, if God is trying to, and I think I think William Lane Craig would say this. I don't know if you guys would would get in the boat with him, but um, that God is trying to actualize the world where the most people are saved. Do do you guys agree with that? Like that's his primary. Where the most people are saved. Uh, I, I really don't know, actually. <laughs> yeah, I would never I mean, make a claim to know something like that. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say for certain. No, currently. <laughs> so, so, uh, that, that, I think this kind of touches on other issues. Do you guys are you, are you guys not of the position position then that scripture kind of speaks to this? Scripture is not clear about this. Well, I, I mean, you know, if I, I've I've leaned to the position because of things like you know how I think God desire you know talking about God desires everyone to save. So that's why I have kind of leaned. I I, I probably would put myself in the boat that God, you know. Tries to saves the most feasible number of people, or something like that. I would say that position has right, some right. initial plausibility. Uh, I, but I wouldn't say that that's necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not so, so much like committed to that, I guess. But I mean, so you guys.